Hi everyone, this is Jen Didetiga reporting from the Real Estate Media News Network on behalf of Maria Recruit, editor of Real Estate Media News Network. So we report on all things real estate are assist deep within the trenches. It's made up of real estate investors, landlords, and land owners who are dealing with the very difficult issues around the LP board, rental licensing and bylaws, and in some cases, outlawing of certain kinds of real estate usage. Our guest speaker of the show is a successful investor and real estate agent. He is investing since 2014. Owns and self-managed multiple properties in Hamilton and the other region, such as St. Catharines, Welland, and Port Coburn. In 2016, he set up his own property management company after experiencing gaps in the industry. He is here to share his experience in property management and he'll provide us in-depth information on how to screen a potential tenants. So I won't hold you for long as I know you're interested to learn about this topic. So let's hear it from Jay Shaw. Welcome Jay. Hey Jenny, thanks for having me on the program tonight. It's my pleasure. So Jay, um, I know there are um, a lot of new investors and new landlords there. So before we get to the topic of how to screen potential tenants, can you tell me a little bit of your background? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, I think you covered a lot of it. So, I mean, uh, my wife and I are uh, real estate investors in the Niagara and Hamilton area. And we started out just like uh, a lot of people watching the program this evening. We started out as uh, you know, wanting to create wealth a different way other than the uh, traditional you know, RSPs, putting money into, um, you know, uh, our work RSPs and stuff like that. We knew that there had to be a different, a better way. We, we saw, you know, those investments not make, you know, virtually any money. And we said that we wanted to do something different. So we started out buying our very first property on the Hamilton mountain in 2014. And we didn't know what we were doing. We made a number of mistakes and we're the first ones to say that we made a number of mistakes. Um, and really what we wanted to do is uh, for every year and every property that we purchased, we learned something. We made mistakes along the way, but as long as we learned something and took something away from it, that's, that's uh, you know, was an important goal for us, right? And, and we continue to learn. So, um, you know, I really appreciate coming on the program this evening, talking to uh, your guests about kind of, you know, our learning and experience and talking about, it's a really important topic that we're talking about this evening in terms of screening tenants because it's, um, you know, it's really, you're putting someone into, you know, your investment, right? You're buying a three, four, five hundred thousand dollar investment. You need to be sure about the people that you're putting into that property. Okay. So let's flash back about your life before you start investing. So where did you live during your younger years? Are you originally from Toronto? No, I'm not. I actually grew up in... Uh, mm -hmm. Northwestern Ontario. I grew up in a little town called Kenora, which is about five hours past Thunder Bay. I like oh. to dub the uh, poor man's Muskoka or the Great White North. Um, oh. Went to school in Ottawa, um, mm -hmm. spent a number of years in Ottawa, moved to Toronto, and then we've since migrated slowly and slowly out of Toronto into, we lived in Hamilton for a bit, uh, and then we now live in the Niagara region. Okay. Do you speak French? Uh, I, I pretend to. Okay, <laughs> that's, a, that's a good thing. Yeah, because I have four kids and all of them speak French. So good for you. In full immersion French, yeah. and uh, the other two was in the regular program, but they have like a French lesson there. So the tip here is when they are talking about something that I don't want to know, they speak in <laughs> French. <laughs> so I said, "What's fishy going right. on here?" There you so, go. You did study in Ottawa. Were yes. you able to apply what you have learned from university to your property management company? Um, a little bit. Like my background's in economics and business. So, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I spent a number, you know, of uh, a number of years in my career not actually using my degree. But I think a lot of what we're doing now, I mean, there is relevancy given the business, uh, my business aspect. But I think the biggest thing, Jenny, what you're hitting on here and what a lot of people need to realize is that, you know, what they're doing by buying a, a rental property, it's not a hobby. It's a, it's, it's a small business and you mm -hmm. have to really manage the property as if it were a business. And a lot of people, 
you know, uh, just think it's a hobby. Uh, you know, the minds and the other thing that I want to talk a little bit about is the mindset, right? Is that you've got this, you know, colloquial mindset of, you know, the landlord and the, you know, and the tenant, right? And it's like, you know, we're not all land barons, believe it or not, right? Like people, you know, that are watching this probably have maybe one, maybe they have two properties, right? I mean, they made a huge investment to buy that property. So, I mean, at the end of the day, when we, when we, you know, talk about it, it's, it's not a landlord, it's an owner, right? And the tenants aren't the tenants, they're your customers, because at the end of the day, your customers are paying down your mortgage. So you yeah. want to make sure that they, they continue to pay down that investment, number one, you also have to treat them as if they're your customers, right? And not just, mm -hmm. oh, the tenant this and the tenant that, right? Mm -hmm. And I know it's a huge responsibility of managing a property. And mm -hmm. at the same time, with all those responsibilities um, up to your shoulder, but what motivates you to establish this property management company? Yeah, no, I mean, it's a great question. I think, uh, we didn't set out to be property managers. We kind of fell into it accidentally and people say, well, how does that actually happen? And I mean, what we found was that um, we, we had always self-managed our properties, right? And then we actually experimented. We bought a student rental a couple of years ago and we experimented with a property manager because we'd never had a student rental. We actually spent more time managing the property manager than actually managing the property. Oh, wow. And That's you know, number one and number two, we just, we just knew that we could do a better job. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people started to approach us and they said, you know, as we kind of joined the network and, and became, you know, known in the real estate investing circle and people asked us, well, who's managing your properties? You guys never seem to have any problems. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we said, well, we do. And they're like, oh, well, you know, I have this property. Like, you know, is that something you'd be interested in? And at first we didn't want to do it. Um, so we, we said, you know, we we'll, we do it, but you know, this is going to be the price and, uh, people said yes. So we were kind of stuck and we kind of, uh, you know, we kind of grew the, grew the business. And now we have a number of, uh, investors that work with us, uh, you know, have multiple properties with us and, and, uh, you know, I mean, we manage the properties as if it, they were our own, even though that they're not right. Yeah. And we're very big in terms of you know, active communication with both the owners and the tenants, doing the proper screening, getting the right people in the property. And number three, doing the preventative maintenance, right? Treating the properties if it, if it were our own, but also not cheaping out, right? Doing the things that need to be done because at the end of the day, that's going to keep your, your tenants happier. Yeah. So here's the interesting question. For the benefit of investors who are new to real estate or investors wanted to do it yourself. So this is a question frequently asked. It is the art of how to screen potential tenants. Yep. In a way. So what advice or tips can you provide to these new investors or new landlords on how to screen potential tenants? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question and I mm -hmm. think you're right. It is a skill and it is an art. And starting out, it's probably the most nerve wracking thing that you'll do, right? Buying the property, you know, no matter if it's 300, 400, 500,000, everyone thinks that that's, you know, that's hard, right? Um, it's probably the easiest part in the process. The second one is really, you know, putting the right people in the property. You know, I think I want to go back to my point that I said from the outset is that this is a business that you're running here. It's not a hobby. And you have to remember what the purchase price is. You're not just going to put anyone in the property, right? Mm -hmm. I think no, no investor wants to make a mortgage payment. I mean, everyone kind of, the minute you have to reach into your own pocket to put money into the property, I think, you know, everyone kind of gets a little squeamish on. But I think the biggest thing is you can't be in a hurry to do this because the big thing um, that you don't realize and that you'll soon, soon realize is that if you haven't been to the landlord tenant board in Ontario, the tenant is essentially the best way that I can describe it. The tenant is an endangered species. Okay. You can't touch them. Right. So once they're in the property, it's very hard to get them out. So you as the as the landlord or the owner of the property, this is your time to be selective, mm -hmm. you know, because at the end of the day, once you put them in, you can't say I changed my mind or I want to get you out. There's mm -hmm. certain rules under the Residential Tenancies Act that prevent you from doing that. So it's a process to get them out. So I think you have to be selective. You have to be picky. I think as Canadians, we're also very polite. We, we don't like to, we don't like to ask a lot of questions. We don't like to pry. We don't like to be invasive, but you have to, this is a $400,000 investment and you're putting someone in there. 
I want to know everything. I want to know who you are. I want to know what you do. I want to know how many people are moving in. And we can talk about all of those questions. But at the end of the day, this is the time to shine. This is the time that you ask the questions. And if people don't want to answer those questions, well, guess what? I'll see you later. You can go find somewhere else to live, right? So you have to do it properly. You have to ask those questions and don't be afraid. And if people give you a hard time, then that's when you, as the owner, need to say, okay, thanks very much. I'll get back to you. Mm-hmm. So, so don't be shy. And I think the last piece that I would say is just remember what you're doing here. Again, going back to the whole business aspect, right? Is that don't lose sight of that fact, right? Run it like a business, not like a hobby. You know, and if you, if you put your best foot forward as an owner, you're going to get very good tenants. Mm-hmm. You know, by that, are you buying the right, you know, you're not, you're not, you know, shoe shopping here, right? You're not looking for a deal, right? You're not looking for the cheapest property in the cheapest neighborhood, because guess what? You're probably going to get not the greatest tenants. So buy nice, nice properties in nice areas, and you're going to attract good quality tenants. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So now let's say I'm, um, I have bought my property, I'm ready to rent it out. So what are the first steps? Is there a sequential steps that I need to do? So, okay, I'm going to like post this somewhere. So what are the steps that I need to do first in order to do that? Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a great question. I think before everyone, the minute they have the property, everyone wants to run to the, run to the computer, run to Kijiji, post it on there right away. The first thing you need to do is what I call a rent ready inspection. Mm-hmm. And what that entails is going through the property and making sure it's ready to rent, right? I go back to that point that I talk about putting your best foot forward, right? And what you have to do is make sure that, you know, it is, you know, it's going to attract the right tenants. So it's like, if the walls are all scuffed up, right? Do you need to touch up on paint? Do you need to do a whole paint job, right? What about if there's carpet? What if there's a big stain? If there's a big stain in the living room, is that going to attract the best quality tenant? So that's a rent ready inspection going through there. Um, you know, it's not like going through and seeing the kitchen and saying, oh, this needs granite countertops. We have to rip out these perfectly good laminate countertops. You know, it's, you know, what we always tell people, um, you know, as agents is that it's not, it's not, would you live there? It's, could you live there? Mm-hmm. Right. So that's number one, number one, rent ready. Number two, get it cleaned. Right. And that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to clean it. You don't have to be there and clean the property. There's lots of cleaning services out there. Get someone in there to do a good deep clean, right? Because at the end of the day, you want to make sure that you're putting your best foot forward, right? Once those two steps are completed, that's when you go to the computer and that's when you start to write your ad. And I think the biggest thing that we found um, with that is you want to make sure, number one, you have you know, lots of pictures, right? And you can do that through a couple of different mediums, right? You can use your, you know, your iPhone or your you know, Android. Um, you know, and, and do them yourself, you know, make sure that you've got like a lot of lighting, um, you know, or spend the extra money and get a professional photographer, right? Some people may balk at that and be like, well, you know, that's like a dollars $200. But think about it this way. If you make the investment now, you're likely not going to have the same tenant for the next 20 years. So okay. you can reuse those photos over and over and over again. So if you make the um, investment now, you can use those down the road. And remember what we talked about, we're running a business here. That is now a business expense that you can write off against your taxes. So uh, there's a lot of like rent ads available in um, the internet or even Mm -hmm. in uh, social media. So what are those social ads or rent ads that I can use? And what is the number one um, ads that I can rely on that I could have a good tenant? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think the ad is the most important thing, right? Where a lot of people don't spend a lot of time writing the ads. And I think what you want to do when you're writing your ad is you want to, you want to kind of plant the seed, right? Paint the picture as to why you want, why, you know, if you were the tenant, why you would want to move into that particular property, you know, beautiful, bright, you know, three bedroom, two bathroom home located in a quiet tree line street, right? So, you know, very nice backyard, you know, fenced backyard for your kids to play. Do you see what I'm doing there? I'm painting the picture as if, it, you know, my ideal tenant for this particular property is a young family with two kids, you know, mom and dad, you know, that are going to take care of the property. 
So I want to gear my ad towards that. I want to talk about the features. You know, no one wants to, you don't want to put an ad out there, um, you know, talking about, you know, subpar house on a busy street, you know, no offense, you know, let your kids roam free in the front yard on a, on a, you know, traffic, right? Like, what does that do, right? So, I mean, you can, what you want to do is paint the picture, talk about the features, right? And why they're relevant for the particular um, tenant that's going to move in there, right? Yeah. So what do you suggest? So now I had a write-up for my ads. Should I put them all in bold, all caps, or small caps? Yeah, no. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're like, um, you know, weird, you're, right? yeah, well, I mean, my parents, you know, when they, when they send me emails, they send it all in caps, right? And, you know, it's, once you tell them that what caps means is that you're yelling at someone, right? So it's mm-hmm. like, we, what you want to try and do is you want to try and write it in a way where there's lots of, not lots of text, but lots of bullets, right? Mm-hmm. If you write lots of text in forms of paragraphs, the user will get lost in that. Typically what we find in the ads that we write is that if you can't get to your point in the first, you know, couple lines, it's lost on people. Mm -hmm. People like, they like bullets, right? So we have one paragraph in terms of how we write it at the front end. And then we have four or five bullets that talk about the property features. And then at the bottom, we have how you can get in touch with us. So really what you want to do is kind of write it in a way that it's like that. If you have loads and loads of text, people don't write it or read it. Okay. It's a very good point there. Can you provide me all the, maybe the top five rental sites that I can post my um, rental app, uh, rental art? Yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it largely depends on the area that you're operating in, but I mean, the number one site that we found is Kijiji. Um, it, sen- it tends to have the most um, traffic. Um, so Kijiji is probably the number one. Uh, number two is uh, PadMapper, uh, okay. or uh, um, so it's like a combination. PadMapper Zumper dot com mm-hmm. is the number two site. Uh, number three is Facebook for Facebook oh. Marketplace. Um, there's also a number of Facebook groups. I mean, for example, we have one that we run uh, in the St. Catharines area called St. Catharines for Rent. Um, we post all of our ads there. We open it up to other landlords um, to post their properties there as well. Um, because at the end of the day, we're all in this together, right? I mean, we are largely competing against one another for spots, but at the end of the day, I mean, you know, we're all going to rent our properties. Um, so it's like if someone, if we can help people along the way in terms of opening that up, that's great. Um, a couple other ones, um, kind of in the Toronto area. I mean, there's uh, viewit.ca, there's gotta rent. I don't have a lot of experience in that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, um, you know, people ask us all the time about Craigslist. Uh, Craigslist is pretty much dead um, on the real estate side. I mean, it's still, uh, I mean, it's very popular in the U.S., but um, I mean, those are really the big ones. So, I mean, my top three would be, as I said, Kijiji, um, mm-hmm. PadMapper, and then Facebook, Facebook Marketplace. And what do you think of putting my ad in MLS.ca? Yeah, I mean, we get the, we get asked that all the time. Um, mm-hmm. Typically with the MLS, um, you get a a more qualified lead. Um, but I mean, the other thing is you have to pay to put it on there. It's usually around, I think it's about $300. Um, and then if you're, you can put it in on there as a private citizen, but typically like you're going to attract other agents who are going to want to be paid a commission. So you would have to, you know, the first question the agent will ask is, are you cooperating with agents? Right. And typically the agent charges, um, you know, between half a month or one month's rent. Okay. Yeah. That I personally, people ask us all the time. I personally don't think you need to do the MLS. I mean, if that's something you're interested in, um, you know, you can certainly do that again. It largely depends on the area that you're operating in. And how would you know that, um, the price that you're putting on your, um, uh, rent is the marketable rent. So you don't want to price your property too low or yep. too high. So what are the sources I can find to validate that this is the right pricing for my property? Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, if you go on, on uh, Kijiji or, uh, or PadMap or Facebook, you know, you want to look at, you want to gauge it against your property. So if you see a property that's, you know, for rent, it's a whole house, it's, you know, $1,800, you, you know, look at, look at, go through the ad and it's like, okay, well, you know, this guy's got 
or this girl's got uh, laminate countertops, I have granite countertops, right? So mine's more of a premium. You know, he's got a larger backyard, I've got a smaller backyard. So it's like, you kind of go through there. I mean, what we always tell investors is that, you know, start high, right? Start high. If you think your property's worth $1,800, let's start at 19, right? Or start at 1895 um, and then work your way down, right? Because at the end of the day, you don't really, you know, you don't really know. It's easier to come down in price than it is to go up. So, I mean, we always tell people start high. I mean, if, you know, in terms of kind of, am I priced right? If you're not getting a lot of action or views, like if you're not getting a lot of responses, like, you know, in terms of people asking if it's available or wanting to come and see the property, then you know it's it's priced too high. We I talked to an investor last week and they told me, they said, yeah, I've had, a, I've had the property listed for two weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, haven't gotten any emails. I'm like, okay, well, what does that tell you, right? Mm-hmm. Tells you you're likely priced too high. And I'm like, what do you price that? And they told me and I'm like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, you're, you're way too high. We've never gotten that, you know, we've never gotten that much. Um, but I mean, they started high, they didn't get what they wanted. So they came down in price. Okay. That's absolutely, um, the right situation there. So now I have this beautiful ad. I post it on TGG and I'm overwhelmed. There's so many applicants that I have on my hand. It's more than like 20. You're so, so popular, Jenny. So popular. What are you gonna do? Yeah, oh I know. So what do I do now with all those applications? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean that's a great question. So the one thing that I'll say about this, and it's really easy for new investors to get frustrated by this. Um, mm-hmm. The world of Kijiji is probably the most interesting place you'll ever experience. So if you've never posted anything on Kijiji, I highly recommend you do it because you will be fascinated with you know the things you see, the people you meet, and the you know the stories you hear, right? So the first question you always, you know, you always get from, you know, whoever it is, right, that responds, right, you may post the ad two minutes earlier, and you'll get a response back, hi, is this still available? It's like, Mm -hmm. I haven't rented the property in the last two minutes, so it is still available, right? So just keep this in mind, you're likely, let's say, for example, you know, you're overwhelmed, you get 20 emails on this place, right? Mm -hmm. So of those 20 emails, probably 10 will drop off. Right. Because from whenever you see, you know, from whenever they sent the email to whenever you respond, let's say it's a couple hours, their life is drastically changed in that two hours for whatever reason. So they drop off the, they drop off the radar for whatever reason. No one knows why, no one understands why, but it's around 50%. Right. So if you get 20 emails, don't expect to get 20 emails back. Right. You'll likely get about 10 emails back. Right. And that's okay. Cause at the end of the day, this is not a popularity contest. You need one tenant to move in. You can't move 20 people into your house, right? Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing, right? And then from there, what you want to do is the end goal of this is you want to get as much information out of, out, of the, uh, out of the lead or out of the prospect, right? And what we always try and do is we always want to try and get them on the phone, right? And the reason we want to get them on the phone is to ask them questions, number one. But number two, I want to see that, you know, they can speak coherently. They can answer the questions. They're not evasive, right? Because if you send back an email, it's very email that, or it's very easy to send back an email, right? Mm-hmm. But if I send back an email with five or six questions, you can think about those questions, right? So if I ask you, Jenny, what do you do for work? You can think about that, right? But if I ask you point blank on the phone, Jenny, what do you do for work? And you don't have an answer for me quickly. I know something's up. I know there's a flag, or I know you're you're just BSing me, right? Okay. So what you want to try and do is get these prospects on the phone. Mm-hmm. That's that's the end goal here. So when an when an email comes in, so for example, in our case, what we do, you know, you get the you know you'll get the emails, and the first email you'll always get is "Hi, is it still available?" Right? Yes. And I, you know, it's the most redundant email because I mean, it's so if I have an ad posted on Kijiji. Mm-hmm. Guess what? It's still available. So what we do in our situation is we respond back and I say, hi, thank you very much for your email. The property is still available, even if they haven't asked or not, um, because that's likely probably the second email you're going to get. Um, we are in the process of setting up some showings. If you are interested in viewing the property, please send me the best number that I can reach you at. And the reason we ask for their phone number is that I want to be in control. I want to be in control of the situation. I want to phone them back when it's convenient for me, not for them. 
because at the end of the day, we're all busy here. You know, we all lead very, you know, busy lives. Um, you know, we all have, you know, ec- you know, commitments, whether they're personal, whether they're family, whether they're ever. The last thing that I want to do is be at home with my kids, making dinner, doing whatever, and get a phone call from some, some person off of Kijiji, right? Mm-hmm. So I want to be in a position where I can get a list of phone numbers, you know, of Betty, of John, of, you know, Lorraine, whoever, right? And then I can sit down, you know, excuse me, when, when my, you know, when my kids are, you know, in bed and I can make phone calls, boom, 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 boom. Okay. So I've done with all those questions in sequence and I have identified that I like this person. And then is there any paperwork that I need to do after I have interviewed the potential tenants? Well, the end goal, after you have the conversation on the phone with them, the next step is you want to get them to the property. Mm -hmm. So you want to show them the property. So, I mean, essentially what you're going to do on the phone is you're really pre-screening them, right? Because at the end, there's a lot of owners out there um, that will basically tell the prospect, yeah, great. Come on over. Here's the address. Here's when I'm showing it. I'm going to be there for two hours. And I cringe at those people because it's like, that's two hours of your life. You're never going to get back waiting for someone that you've never talked to on the phone, Mm -hmm. right? So what we try and do with our properties is we set, we set everyone up for the same time. It's like, I'm showing the property tomorrow at six o'clock. Would you like to come take a look at it? And this, again, you want to be in control of the situation, right? Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, you're going to get a lot of, well, I can't make, how about 7.30, right? I work till seven. So how about 7.30? Sorry, I'm only showing it at six o'clock. I have to show another property after. Even if you don't, even if you only have one property, you tell people that I'm only showing the property at six o'clock. If that doesn't work for you, unfortunately, we're going to have to find another time. Okay. And as an, as a new landlord, you, it's probably the most scariest thing you're going to tell people, but you'd be surprised that people will either a, they'll rearrange their schedule they'll mm-hmm. try and make other arrangements or they will follow up. They will actually follow up with you and say, I really want to show this property because at the end of the day, number one, you only need one person to fill that property mm-hmm. and it's not going to be the first person to give you the money, right? You need to do your due diligence, which I'm sure we'll we can talk about a little bit later. So I have already like uh, spoken to them. Uh, I did my viewing to them and it seems that they're pretty okay. And I want to proceed of getting to know them so what's the next step for that yeah no so the next step is i mean they come they look at the property i mean you you're also kind of you know you're eyeing them too right because you want to look at kind of do they show up on time right you you know you want to look at things like do they show up on time do they present themselves well you know do they ask good questions um what kind of car do they drive you know do they smoke right? Mm -hmm. These are things you want to ask. And it's, you know, not, not that you want to ask, but you want to be aware of, right? And I'm not saying to discriminate someone because they smoke or not, but you have to be mindful of the fact that if they do smoke, are they going to smoke in your house? Mm -hmm. Even though you put in the, in the lease that it's a non-smoking environment, are they going to smoke in your house? So Mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we have tenants that smoke and that's totally fine, but they Mm -hmm. don't smoke in our house. And we know that because we visit it regularly. But anyways, then after that, and they're interested and they want to proceed, the next step is to get them to fill out an application form. Okay. And really, that's the most important thing because that's when you're really kind of digging into them and, and their background. And you're, so there's a, number of, uh, there's a number of services online that you can use um, to look at um, you know, their application. So there's one, there's called, one is called Neighborly. Um, that's okay. what we use. Um, there's another one that's called tenant verification services. Uh-huh. Yes. Um, there's a few others. Um, these are, they're relatively inexpensive, but what they allow you to do is fill out an application number one and number two, pull their credit, right? Always be wary as an owner. If someone shows up with an Equifax credit report or credit karma credit report, do not ever take someone else's credit report. And the reason I say that is that those documents can be easily forged online. And what, I'll, what I will say to your, uh, to your viewers is after this episode, go online and put Google fake Equifax credit report and see what pops up. There's a website where you can make your own credit report and it's free and people do that wow. and you would be surprised. So this is the point where you have to be suspect of everyone, right? 
Yeah. And you have to, because at the end of the day, trust is earned. It's not given. So mm-hmm. you need to do your due diligence. Yeah. So in your app, do you want me to talk about the application form or? Yes. Um, I just want to know, um, for those techie people that are willing to uh, fill up the application online, whether it's Naval B or TBS, yep. but what about those potential tenants that still uh, the old traditional way of filling up the rental application through paper words. So what should we do to accommodate them? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I mean, we've always kind of, um, you know, we've always gone the techie route. We've always tried to encourage them to use the computer as much as possible. Okay. Um, I just had uh, a couple, they were in their early 70s mm-hmm. and they filled out the application online. And they had uh, a family member system. Um, the program that we use, as I mentioned, Neighborly, um, they have excellent customer service. Uh, you know, I gave them a toll-free number. I said, call these guys. They will walk you through everything and help you. Oh. And they were able to do it, right? Think, uh, But, I mean, at the end of the day, it's not for everyone. So you need to be flexible, right? Yeah. But you also have to realize that if you're, you know, sitting in front of a, you know, a couple that are in their, you know, 60s and 70s, are they actually – the ones out there that are faking their credit report. So okay. that those are not likely the ones that you're, you know, ha- going to have to worry about. So I mean, you have to be flexible in your, in how you do things. But I mean, what you always want to try and do is use the tools that are there for you. Okay. And what would be uh, the best approach? So they have filled up the rental application. I have assessed them. And personally, like I like what I have heard and information on the rental application seems to match. So what other information that I need to look at and verify, considering that they have, they have lived on their own and this is the first time that they are renting? Um, So, I mean, the things you want to look at, I mean, number one, you want to verify their identity. You want to make sure that they are who they are. So you get a copy of their driver's license, Mm -hmm. right? Or some sort of government issued uh, photo ID. Uh, you can't you, you know, it would either be a driver's license or a passport okay. unfortunately you cannot ask uh, for a health card in Ontario mm-hmm. uh, so those are the two documents that we look for uh, passport uh, driver's license um, you want to verify their income so if they say that they're making you know fifty thousand dollars that you know fill a name of job here you mm-hmm. need something to substantiate that whether that's a, a pay stub or an employment letter mm-hmm. that employment letter or pay stub needs to be current Ooh, it's 60 days or less because I mean something could have happened in the last 60 days. Maybe they're not at that job. Maybe they've changed jobs. Maybe they've been fired. So you need to have something that's current. Okay. Um, and then obviously the third thing you want to do is you want to look, you want to have a look at their credit. So you want to make okay. sure that, you know, they have decent credit. Mm-hmm. So if this is the first time that they're renting, of course they don't have a landlord's reference. Right. Yep. So what other references that I can use to justify their, um, like, you know, personality, traits, character? Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. it, and this happens a lot too, um, you know, with, um, you know, a number of our, uh, a number of our tenants now, I mean, we're seeing a lot of people that are going through separation divorces. Um, so they've owned their home for 20 years and now they're, you know, now they're renting, right? So those people are also people that don't tend to have, uh, a landlord reference so we ask for a personal reference we ask for you know um you know character reference uh and then we ask for a professional reference so those are that's how we kind of get around it but i mean at the end of the day um yeah again you have to be flexible in what what uh, in your application right it's not very it, it can't be bureaucratic it's not like if this happens you know you we can't take you so you have to be flexible in terms of the situation um, and again, remember, these are all tools, right? So it's mm-hmm. like your credit, your income, your, your references, right? Um, these are all, you know, in addition to meeting the person, these are all tools that you need to use, right? It's not like if this, if this doesn't meet this, you're out, right? Because everyone has a story, right? Mm-hmm. And everyone's situation is a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's excellent. So um, with all the information that provided to how to screen the potential tenants, so let's apply the learning. So I would like to have like a role playing where I could be the potential tenant. Sure. And it would be my uh, future landlord or property manager. So I would um, 
fill up my application or I'm searching for a property like a two bedroom because I have um, a son who's nine years old and I'm a single mom but I have a full-time job and I go to this uh, KGG ad and I see this two bedroom one full bath apartment that is worth like 13 50 so I think that um, I can afford to rent this property so I go on the KGG and I sent my text to the landlord who provided the ad, and I texted, is this available? So what would be the response <laughs> that? To was that? my question I was gonna ask you, is, are you yeah. gonna say it's available? So what I would do, I mean, I, I've kind of talked a little bit about what we respond to that, and I write back, I would write you back, I'd be like, hi Jenny, thanks for reaching out, the property is still available, we're just in the process of setting up some showings for later this week. Uh, if you're interested in coming to take a look at the property, Please tell me the best number that I can reach you at, and I'll get in touch with you as soon as possible. Okay, okay. so I'm responding to your ad, and I would say thank you for, my, for your immediate response. I am available on a Saturday at 1 p.m. because I work like 16 hours from Monday to Friday. Would it be possible to see the property on a Saturday? So I would write back. I'd be like, hi, Jenny. Thanks. Thanks for your response. If you could send me the best number to reach you at, uh, I'd be happy to discuss it further with you. Because again, okay. what you want to do is you want to do it's it's Jenny's trying to basically control the situation, right? She has a busy life and I understand that. But at the end of the day, I've asked her a very simple question. I said, Jenny, what's the best number to reach you at? So I've asked you, I've asked her again, that's the second time. So if Jenny comes back to me again and doesn't give me a number, then I just move on. Cause at the end of the day, I've asked her twice what the number is or for her phone number to set up a time. Cause before I'm booking an appointment with Jenny, there's a few questions that I need to ask her before we even set up a time. Okay. That's a great point. Now the second applicant, I'm the, se uh, the second scenario is we're two young professionals and we're looking for a two-bedroom property in Niagara region. So I sent an email to the landlord and I asked the same question again. But this time is the question is, is still is this still available? We are two young professionals and we're quiet people and we work downtown and we are very interested to see the property. Yeah, so those ones are great because they give you a little bit more information, right? What they're trying to do too is they're trying to put their best foot forward, right? Because at the end of the day, there is a number of people, they realize that this is a nice property and there's going to be likely a number of people that want to come and see it. So I want to make sure that if I get an appointment that, that Jay's going to remember when he goes to the property that, oh, you're the young professionals that work downtown, right? Mm -hmm. So... You know, again, what I, what I would do is I would respond with the same thing because at the end, the end goal is to get the person, the prospect on the phone so that you can ask them the screening questions. And then from there, that's when you're going to book the appointment. Okay. That's a great point there. So now we're down to um, the two co-play there. And I want to summarize what are the common mistakes that landlords do when screening the tenants? Can you name three? Can I name three? Just three? Just three for now. I think the biggest, the biggest mistake that they make um, is they don't get enough information. They don't ask the right questions, right? Um, so, you know, first and foremost, you need to ask the right questions, right? So when you get the prospect on the phone, you want to ask them, mm -hmm. you know, you want to have that conversational tone. So it's like, it's a very easy to have a list of seven questions that you want to ask, but it's how you ask them, right? So for you, Jenny, like, you know, I'm not going to get on the phone and be like, what do you do for work? How much money do you make? How many people are moving in? So what I want to do is I want to have a conversation with you, even though I have my seven questions right in front of me, I know. So that when I call you, I'm like, Hey Jenny, my name's Jay. You sent me an email about this property we have for rent. I just I just want to ask you a couple of quick questions. Okay, go right? ahead. So what I'm what I'm doing here is I'm 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 disarming Jenny. It's like, okay, when do you want to move for Jenny? And then I want to say, you know, how many people how many people are moving in, Jenny? Is it just yourself, or is it you know you and your six cats, or like who's moving in? And then you know, 
And then the other thing you want to ask is you don't want to ask how much money you make. You want to ask, what do you do for work? And the reason you ask it like that, what do you do for work? Because then they'll tell you a little bit more. Oh, I work, you know, I work, uh, I'm a, you know, a server, blah, blah, blah. You know, so then if they tell you, like, for example, they're a server at, let's say, you know, the keg, well, they make decent money, but a lot of it is in tips. So a lot of their income is going to be cash, which is not verifiable, right? So you can discern a lot of information by asking the right questions, number one. Number two, um, you know, credit reports. Credit reports are very intimidating. A lot of people don't know how to read them. Mm -hmm. So when you get a credit report, you're like, well, what does this mean? The other thing is, what if there's things on the credit report that you don't understand? And why is the credit score, you know, so let's say, for example, it's, you know, low, right? It, he makes good money. He pays his bills on time, you know, but there's this massive judgment for X amount of dollars, right? And then, so what does that mean, right? So some people don't want to ask that question. And you have to, you have to ask the uncomfortable questions, um, you know, in order to get a better understanding of the picture. But the biggest mistake that new landlords make is they, they rely on their gut and they don't rely on the tools that are in front of them, such as verifying their income, such as, um, you know, such as um, um, verifying their identity, like calling the landlords. A big one that people do is they always call the immediate landlord. Well, the, if, you're, if you're the tenant from hell, the immediate landlord, when you call that immediate landlord, what are they going to tell you? They're going to sing this tenant's praises. And the reason they're going to do that, because they want to get them out of their property. They're not going to sit there and be like, oh, he's, you know, she's this, she's that, whatever. They're going to sing their praises to get them out. So what we always do is we phone the second landlord where the, pro where the, where the tenant isn't living. And you get a much different answer because they're long gone. Yes. Okay. The, the last one, Jenny, I'll say is this, is that before you even give keys to anyone, mm -hmm. you need to collect first and last month's rent. Okay. Everyone's, you know, everyone's got a story of like, oh, I can give you this, I can give you that, or I don't have everything, but I can give it to you on the 5th after oh. I've moved in. And you have to collect that in certified funds. No checks. So it needs to be a bank draft or it needs to be an email money transfer. And if they can't give you those, I'm sorry, we don't give keys to people. And I've done that before where it's like they've shown up at the house on the first. They say, well, I only have, I'm $500 short or I'm $200 short. And I say, I'm sorry, I can't give you the keys. You know, I need first and last month's rent. And if you don't have that, then I can't give you the keys. They're like, well, we've signed a lease. I'm like, that's great. But until you give me the, until you give me the full first and last month's rent, I can't give you keys. Mm -hmm. And I've said, call me when you have you know, when you have the money and mm -hmm. guess what? Two days later, I got a call and two days later I showed up at the property and I gave them the keys. Wow. But if you don't do that now, again, once they're in, it's hard to get them out and you need to be in control of the situation because you are running a business and it's not a hobby. You're not, mm -hmm. you're not the land baron. You're the small business owner. You cannot let your tenants problems become your problems. I totally agree. So that's a lot of giveaway information for new landlords and new investors. So Jay, what's your final message to the new owners, new real estate investors for them to come out and have their journey as a new investors? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is don't be afraid to ask questions. There are so many resources out there, whether they're online, whether they're through networking groups, whether they're from education groups, Go out and talk to people and ask questions on how they do things. Don't be afraid because at the end of the day, um, you know, Jenny, you were, you know, you were in the same boat as I was, you know, when we first started, right? We didn't know what we were doing and we stumbled our way through it and we did okay. And, you know, um, you don't need to be an expert at everything and ask questions, use the resources that are out there. But remember, you're running a business and you need to run it like a business. Because if not, I mean, you're going to be, you're going to have one trouble, you're going to have trouble after trouble. And I think the other thing that you need to realize is remember the mindset shift as an owner, but also as a customer. So, I mean, as a new owner, if things come up in the property, get them dealt with quickly. You know, your customers are paying you top rent. 
or uh, to live where they are. So if they call you and say, hey, I don't have heat or hey, I don't have this or hey, I don't have that, say, I'll get someone there right away. They don't, it doesn't need to be like that night unless they have no heat or, you know, no, uh, no AC. But if it's like, hey, you know, the, there's a, you know, a small leak or, or there's this, we're like, yeah, great, yeah. we'll send someone right away, right? So that's the big thing is address the problems right away because the big reason why uh, tenants move is because of outstanding maintenance issues. Don't be a slumlord. Be, be better than a slumlord. Be, be yourself. Treat it as if how you would like to be treated as a tenant. That's absolutely right. Thank you, Jay, for guessing our show. And hope we can like invite you for the next yeah, absolutely. We have for next year. And thank you for sharing it to the viewers. I'm sure they'll be glad to like, you know, absorb all those information and ready with their journey. So where they where can they find you? Do you have yeah. a Facebook page or podcast? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've got a couple of things. I mean, you can okay. find me on Facebook, Jay Shaw. Um, our management company is called Welcome Home Management. So it's welcomehomemgt.ca. Okay. And then my wife, Erica, myself, and our colleague, Brian Fitzgerald, uh, run our own podcast. It's called the Real Estate Investors Lounge, um, which you can find on uh, iTunes or uh, Google Play. Uh, we also have a website. Uh, it's called the reilounge.ca. Okay. So check us out there. We have some really great guests and uh, yeah, I mean, anything that we can do to help, I mean, uh, whether it's uh, support or if you're even uh, interested in, in property management, feel free to reach out. Okay, that's great. So thank you for sharing that great value information to the viewers and listeners. So for the listeners, if you want to know more, please share, like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel and Facebook site, Real Estate Media News Network. And we will also post uh, Jay Shaw's website there. So it's about more details about it. And then we can check the Facebook page for his um, website and podcast. Thank you for viewing and listening. Bye for now. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you.